Hey everyone, Fraser here, back again at the American Astronomical Society meeting in Honolulu, Hawaii. Once again, I've brought another guest expert here to answer your space zinger questions. Jeff Faust, who uh, reports for Space News, Space Review, has been doing this job longer than I have. And if there's anybody who can tackle the just the unanswerable questions, it's going to be Jeff. So Jeff, take it away. All right. Maz Oler. Is it possible there are airtight caves on Mars that still contain part of the ancient atmosphere? That's probably unlikely. Um, you know, the ancient Martian atmosphere eroded away billions of years ago. For, for something to be airtight as long as that is very unlikely. What you might find are rocks that may contain really tiny bubbles of the early Martian atmosphere, which would be interesting from a scientific aspect in terms of understanding exactly what the composition of the Martian atmosphere was, but it wouldn't be particularly useful from any sort of settlement concept. If you could find a, a cave like that, that would be a great place to actually set up a future settlement in that it's shielded from the radiation, you could seal it off, you could make it airtight potentially and fill it with air at some point. Same is true on the moon as well. There are lava tubes just below the surface of the moon that many scientists have identified as potential places where you could set up a base in the future. Maximus Payne, what would be the actual motivation to go to Mars? There are a whole lot of motivations to go from Mars. Some people are motivated by the scientific aspect to try to understand the history of Mars, whether it once was it contain life, whether it might still have life today. Um, a lot of people are motivated by the prospect of going to Mars to establish a second home for humanity, um, a sort of plan B uh, to ensure life continues if something bad happens on Earth. Um, there are, to be honest, a lot of geopolitical motivations. Who is going to be the first country to set humans on to Mars. Um, there was a space race in the 1960s between the United States and the Soviet Union that drove the Apollo program and the lunar landings. Might we be, see some sort of geopolitical contest between say the United States and China in the coming decades to go to Mars? So there are a lot of motivations for go to Mars. The question is what motivation or combination of motivations will be the ones that will really drive people to go to the red planet sometime in the foreseeable future? Scott Bragdon. Hi Fraser, love your content. Since ground-based telescopes are going to be affected by the Starlink satellites, what do you think about attaching a telescope to some of the Starlink satellites? It's an interesting idea. The problem is, is that it's, it's difficult to make uh, satellites do two very different things very well. Um, you can be a very good communication satellite, you can be a very good science satellite. Trying to do both would be, be very difficult. What you want to do is to perhaps take some of the technologies that are being enabled by Starlink and SpaceX's own launch systems to make it cheaper and less expensive to launch dedicated space telescopes to take on some of the astronomical tasks that can't be done on Earth um, at all or might be hindered uh, by future mega constellations but like Starlink. DZ Ace, can the gravity experiments be done here on Earth with animals in a centrifuge? Even though we can only get high gravity levels, we could more accurately guess that the opposite will be true in low gravity. That's an interesting question. One of the big challenges for the future of long-term human spaceflight, including missions to the moon and missions to Mars, is the effects of reduced gravity on the human environment. We obviously have a lot of experience about how humans can handle one gravity. We have a growing knowledge of uh, information about how humans last and can, can live in zero G. What we don't know is that what happens in between, the one sixth gravity of the moon, the roughly three eighths gravity of Mars, we have no information really about how the hum human body can handle that. Is one sixth gravity enough to avoid some of the worst effects of zero gravity? Is three eighths gravity not enough to, to handle some of those effects? That's something we really haven't studied. And so one of the ways to do that would be with a centrifuge in space rather than on Earth that could be spun up to simulate Martian gravity or lunar gravity. It's something scientists have talked about for a number of years, um, but we have very little in the way of data to, or plans to do something like that uh, for the foreseeable future. Arjon, has anybody tried to do surgery or other involved medical procedures in micro or zero gravity, like on rats or something? A Mars mission may have a doctor, but they might not know how their treatments will work in the low to no G environment. 
There have been a limited number of experiments about medical procedures like surgery. A lot of it's actually been done not in space, but on parabolic aircraft flights, like the what's been commonly called the vomit comet, the aircraft that go up and down and simulate about 30 seconds of, of weightlessness um, during those flights. Uh, so you can get a little bit of experience with doing that, um, but there's still a lot we have to learn about what surgical procedures can and can't be done in weightlessness. Gordon Chin, what are some things that humans can do in space that robots cannot do? Well, one of the things is that humans are actually very dexterous. We can do a lot of things with our hands. Um, we're just starting to get to similar capabilities with robotic arms. Um, I think another aspect, though, is really not necessarily our hands, but our head, in that humans are, are intelligent, they can think, they're curious, they'll see things and they'll stop and they'll study them in greater detail on the spot rather than a robot that might see something and then controllers on the ground will then direct it to go do something, a process that can take much longer. Uh, and also, if you're traveling far from Earth, you don't have the light travel time delays that you would have even on the moon where you have one or two seconds um, or Mars where it can be many minutes. Dan D. How exactly will Starlink disturb science astronomy? Can it be quantified? Astronomers are just starting to grapple with the effects of what are called mega constellations or large constellations, fleets of satellites like Starlink. They have a little bit of experience with things like the Iridium satellite constellation that was initially launched 20 years ago, but that had fewer than 100 satellites. Starlink is talking about eventually launching tens of thousands of satellites. And the problem with these satellites is that after sunset and before sunrise, they can reflect the sunlight and appear as bright objects in the sky. And you can imagine an astronomer trying to take an image of a particular area of the sky and then suddenly have one or two or dozens of these pass through the field of view during an observation. So one of the challenges right now that astronomers and engineers are dealing with is what can be done to mitigate the brightness of these? Are there ways to darken these satellites to make them less reflective? so that they produce less of an impact. And in fact, one of the Starlink satellites launched just this week um, has special coatings on it designed to reduce its reflectiveness. And so we'll soon find out how well that works and if that can then be used on future Starlink satellites and also on other satellites from other constellations, from companies like OneWeb and Amazon and others that are planning large fleets of satellites that could have impacts on astronomy as well. Memotype. With the number of satellites increasing, especially with Starlink and the other mega constellations going up over the next few years, how will this affect rocket launches and capsule landings in the future? You know, that touches on an issue that's, that in the space field is called space traffic management. And that is, how do you prevent satellites from colliding with one another? And there have been a few cases in the past where there have been close approaches, or even in one case, a collision between an Iridium satellite and a defunct Russian satellite that created a tremendous amount of orbital debris. So being able to better track these objects and being better able to have the ability to move these satellites if they're on a close approach is something that, that's handled. It's less of an issue for launches and landings, although still, if you're planning a launch, you do do what's called a collision assessment and make sure that there's nothing passing overhead when you're launching. Um, and sometimes some launches have to be rescheduled by just a few minutes one way or another um, to avoid one of those close approaches. But certainly as the number of satellites increases, that problem will grow and it will become a major issue for the overall space community uh, in the future. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time to answer all of these questions. It's great to get uh, another industry expert here to, uh, to tackle all these. Uh, a bunch of questions I don't have to handle anymore. Um, but uh, where can people find out more about what you're working on? Well, you can go visit Space News at spacenews.com, and you can visit the Space Review at thespacereview.com. Perfect. We'll put links to all of those. Jeff, thanks again. Have fun uh, here in Hawaii. Thank you.